Welcome to Grace Church. Today we are gathered to worship our King who has revealed Himself to us. The light shines into our darkness through our individual darkness, and He rescues us from the darkness. Let's hear our call to worship today from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 12. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will, be, will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. All Kedar's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth will serve you. They will be accepted as offerings on my altar, and I will adorn my glorious temple. Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? Surely the islands look to me. In the lead are the ships of Tarshish, bringing your children from afar with their silver and gold to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Foreigners will build, rebuild your walls, and their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut day or night to that people, so that people may bring you the wealth of the nations. Their kings led in triumphal procession for the nation of kingdom, uh, of, for the nation or kingdom that will not serve you will perish. It will be utterly ruined. God our Father, in love you created us. Father, you came to us as a babe born in the barn. In your love, you welcome us as your children. In your love, you lead us faithfully. And with your mercy, Father, you hear our prayers. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. Hear us, your children, as we come before you to worship. Jesus, our Redeemer, you've come and you have saved the world. You've saved us. You call us to follow you. You've taught us truth. In our times of trouble, Father, you offer to us peace. Meet us this day as we come, Father, to hear your word, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, the living one, in the beginning you breathed life into us. In the chaos that was and the darkness, you brought hope. And on one night, you brought good news that a Savior was born. You defeated death forever. Speak to us. Speak to us this day, your people. God, loving Father, Son, and Spirit, we come. Yet we know we come at times with doubts and with fears. Sometimes with ignorance. We know we have failed you, your people, in many ways. But we trust in your love. You will not turn from us. May we turn to you. As we open our hearts to your mercy and forgiveness, grant us your peace. Lord Jesus, please forgive us. Heal us deeply within so that we will love and trust you more deeply day by day. Accept this prayer. Accept our worship. Father, accept us again through your love shown and given to us in Jesus Christ, who came, who lived, who died, who rose again and is with us now and who will come again. We thank you for your promises. Accept this gift of worship. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Everyone needs compassion A love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness And the kindness of a Savior The hope of nation Savior, he can move the mountains My God is mighty to save 
A big hello to families and kids this morning. I'm gonna give a five second countdown to gather up all the kids for the family time message. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi. Do you guys like taking pictures? When you do, do you use one of these probably most of the time, right? A, f a cell phone camera, flip it up, take a snap of a picture, easy breezy. Well, it wasn't always like that. You know, back when I was your age, and for a long time, people taking pictures could only take pictures one way, and they needed to use a camera, but inside the camera there was film. Something, it was kind of like this, but it was dark, and it would be stuck inside the camera, and the film is what, when you snapped your picture, is what would put the picture on it. But when when you would uh, do that, you, you didn't see your picture right away. There was a whole bunch of things that had to happen. When I was growing up, I remember my dad taking his film to get developed. It was a place where you would go and it would, they would make the picture come to life. But there was a lot of things involved with that. Uh, this was pr probably for more than a hundred years, the way people took pictures. And the other thing, on your camera, you can take as many pictures as you want because, you know, I have hundreds, maybe even more than a thousand pictures on my camera. But when you took pictures back when I was your age, you could usually take 24 pictures at a time. Not very much, right? And it was very expensive to do it. People didn't know, um, people were always thinking, should I take this picture? Should I not take this picture? Now, I'm just going to snap it away. Boom, 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 boom. No problem. It's gotten a lot easier to take pictures and to make and to take pictures making memories uh, with your cell phones in different ways it's gotten a lot easier to take nice pictures and we have lots of nice pictures that we could share and show to everybody it's not hard at all you know some things get easier with time and i'm so glad to tell you that the bible tells us that coming to to god has gotten easier too you see the bible tells us that a long time ago going getting to god and and being able to speak to God was a hard process. People couldn't go directly to the Lord in prayer. They had to go to the temple. They would then go and, and they'd have to have a ceremonial wash. They had to bring a sacrifice. Then they had to take that sacrifice to the priest who would take the sacrifice to the altar. And that's where they would ask the Lord for forgiveness of their sins. But you know, just like the way taking pictures has gotten so easy, thanks to Jesus, we don't have to do any of those things anymore. There's no obstacles left between us and God. When we pray in the name of Jesus, and Jesus was the sacrifice for us, so we don't have to bring another one. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we can pray directly to God. We can talk directly to him anytime with no limitations, with no restrictions, with nothing in the way. It's just us talking to God, but always through and because of Jesus. So when we pray, before the word amen comes out of our mouth, we say, we pray this in the name of Jesus, because it's because of Jesus that we can do with just that. That's an amazing thing. And, and, and I'm so thankful that Jesus gave us that gift. We'll see you next time, okay? It's great to see you this morning. Thank you, Dan. And just uh, one announcement today, uh, and just actually a reminder as well, so if you're joining us uh, right now, a little bit later, uh, at the beginning of the service, the announcements are now scrolling through as the prelude is playing, and so I do want to just let you know that the announcements are there, and then I highlight uh, one or two in this time, just to um, uh, highlight those that... that uh, you know, uh, seem to be more timely. Uh, and this one is uh, about Bible Reading Club. <clears throat> so with the new year, many of us have chosen New Year's resolutions, and perhaps some of you have decided that you wanted to read your Bible more. 
And for those of you who would like to have accountability, I would love for you to consider joining me in a group where we'll meet once per month, and we'll just talk about the things that the Lord seems to be bringing up in our lives or something that we've never noticed before or even something that's just plain hard, like, I just don't understand this or why is this in the Bible? And we can talk about that. And so we'll begin in a couple of weeks. And uh, if you want to know which uh, program I'm using, I I subscribe to esv.com. ESV, English Standard Version, so esv.com, and they send me my Bible readings daily right into my, uh, into my inbox and my email, and then I can just read it there. Uh, the reason I've chosen that this year is it's a nice little format where they give you Old Testament reading, a Psalm reading, a New Testament reading, and a proverb as well, and so it's a nice little uh, a variety there. Uh, and so if you'd like to join us, please do. Now again, like this is for anyone, so maybe you've chosen a different frequency instead of reading the whole Bible in a year. Maybe you've just decided, okay, I always get stuck in Leviticus, <laughs> and so I'm just going to read like one chapter at a time. That's great. I still would love for you to j- consider joining this group as well. And if you are someone that's, that's started and restarted reading the Bible, you know, why not start at a different par- uh, part? Why not skip Leviticus altogether? Or uh, I'd love to encourage you. Uh, maybe Bible reading is the, the resolution, that spiritual formation piece that you want to pick up this year. And so I just want to encourage you, whatever frequency it is, sometimes we bite off a really big chunk and we say, okay, I'm going to do it all in a year. But I want to encourage you, if that's what the Lord is laying on your heart, and you do have difficulty and maybe uh, uh, the reading isn't your thing, you know, I just want to encourage you, maybe it's just a chapter a day and to plug away at it. And over time, you will get it done, and it's good for us. It's so good for us because we get to know the Lord more. And so I just want to encourage you in that way. So consider joining me. Uh, You can email me or you can call into the church, and I'll I'll make sure that Cheryl knows that she can just update me. And uh, we'll meet over Zoom for now just because of everything that's been going on. And uh, hopefully in the future, we can also meet in person. And it'll just be, again, just that once per month and just a a short little time of just discussion and, uh, and just accountability and encouragement as well. All right, so those are the announcements for this week. And let's hear our first reading. Hi everyone, the first reading today comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. Let's pray together. 
Lord, you are our light, and you shine through our darkness. So, Father, forgive us for not reflecting that light in our own lives, for not making it easier for people to see your light in us that should be shining through us. Forgive us for being like Herod, clinging to the status quo and not allowing the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Or perhaps, and I know this is often true of myself, Lord, we are often like the chief priests and scribes who knew, who knew about your coming and yet did not search and did nothing. Lord, often that is us. We know the things your scripture tells us. We know the ways that we should be obedient or the ways that we uh, can search you out and know more about who you are and what you want of us and for us to thrive, and yet we don't do it. And so, Father, forgive us for these things. Lord, may your light break forth, and may people be drawn to you. And Lord, now we take a moment to confess those sins that the Holy Spirit is bringing to mind. Lord, thank you for the work of the Spirit in our lives and for Jesus Christ, that he who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Father, we bring our hurting world to you. We pray for your mercy, for your healing, for your continued protection. We give you thanks and we ask for wisdom over our government officials, for our scientists, for our doctors, for the researchers, for all involved as they uh, seek to guide us and lead us. Lord, we ask for your wisdom over them. Lord, we think of our world and we are uh, dismayed at some of the things that are happening around, like, for example, with Russia and their relationship with the Ukraine. God, we pray for peace in that region. We pray for wisdom of the officials and the leaders involved, that they would be able to uh, seek out a peaceful resolution. Lord, we pray for the unrest within Kazakhstan today as well. <clears throat> Father, we ask for peace. Lord, we think of our world and the ways that we are called to be stewards and we are called to uh, love our planet. Father, we think of the Dakacha woodland in Kenya. We pray for protection over this important ecosystem that is constantly under attack from, from, uh, um, uh, uh, from uh, global warming and from, uh, you know, just the selling of the woods uh, to, to other conglomerates. And God, we just ask for you to, uh, uh, to protect that area where there are all these different species, all these different animals that uh, can't be found anywhere else. And so, God, we ask for your protection. Father, we ask and pray for uh, our brother and sister, for the Finnish bishop, uh, Johanna Poyola, and the politician Paivi Rasinen, who are on trial for their biblical convictions, who will be on trial for their biblical convictions. And we pray for what this means for the Finnish disposition towards the Bible, towards what it means to follow Jesus Christ, and what it means for religious freedom and freedom of speech in that country as well. We pray for wisdom there. Lord, we also bring before you our neighbors in the South. We continue to pray for racial reconciliation there. Father, we are grateful that justice has been served to the three men who killed Ahmad Arbery. We also pray for those three men as well. We pray for repentance, for forgiveness, uh, for a true change of heart. God, we pray for safety for their families. We pray for Ahmad Arbery's family as well, that this would bring peace to their hearts. Lord, we also bring to you our teachers and students uh, who just finished another week back online. Lord, what a difficult time, and what a difficult time for families as well who are stretched so thin, who have been stretched so thin, and are stretched again because of this. And again, we pray for our officials who are uh, thinking past this next week and what to do in the following weeks and, and the importance of the mental health of the children and all that that goes into it. And so, Lord, we ask for wisdom. Father, we bring before you our church, our denomination, ourselves. Lord, in this new year, we pray for revival. We pray for our hearts that you would transform us, renew us. We pray that you would deliver us from the evil one. We pray for our denomination that you would set us aright, that our love for you 
would be uh, our zeal for you would trump everything else, that we would love you most of all. God, we bring before you our loved ones here at our church. We pray for healing for Trinity, for Jean, for Jack W. and Jack M. We pray for Sinead, George, Camille, Carol, Jessica, Darylin, Lorraine, Ellie, Pinky, for Thelma, Ian, Jim K., and Paul B. And we also pray for others that come to our minds at this time. Thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you love us. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. And so we sing together. Our second reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, well, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to His eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly. And Lord, uh, there is so much that creates defensiveness in us, Sometimes there are things that we need to hear, but we don't want to hear, and that's for every single one of us. And yet, Lord, we come before you this morning, wherever we are, and we ask that you would help us to come to you with open hearts so that we may have ears that truly hear, that we may have hearts that are truly open, that we can truly see you with eyes that are wide open. And for that, Lord, we need your help. And we ask these things Uh, we ask for this. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and and acceptable to you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be back. I want to thank uh, Reverend Jared Miller for sending us that message last week. And thank you for Don, who filled in all the other pieces so wonderfully and and so clearly. It was really, really great. So thank you for that. Um, So last week, uh, 
uh, Reverend Miller, Reverend Jared Miller, he, he gave us a, an, a, an epiphany message, and, and here we are still in the season of epiphany, actually, and so uh, we're going to be talking about this mystery made known. Now, this past Friday, the three men who chased down and killed Ahmad Arbery were each sentenced to life in prison. I mean, they are going through an appeal process, but as it stands right now, they have been sentenced to life in prison. This points not only to the brokenness in the United States, and we can, it's not as if we can point our finger at them and say, look how broken they are. And it's not as if we can point to specific states and say, look how broken they are. But what this points to is our collective broken hearts. There is something broken in each and every one of us. We just have to look into history to see how this broken, sinful part of our hearts, our fear of other people, and what we believe makes us different from each other and holds us apart from each other is cyclically revealed over and over and over again. Look at what happened in Rwanda in 94. Or just before that, in 89, I believe, and in the 90s in Bosnia. Or even before that, the long history in South Africa. And coinciding with that era was also under Hitler. And even before that, we only have to look to not that long ago, actually, when we see the cause of the Civil War in the United States as as the, the debate around how do we treat other human beings and the slave trade came to a head. Now, another uh, notable figure died recently on December 26th, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And what will be remembered most about him is his fight against apartheid in South Africa. Now, if we need a reminder of that, that's the racist system of governance that was so woven into their culture that it made it okay to make black South Africans subhuman and to treat them in that way to keep them from having a voice, and to keep them from any level of government, and it was terrible. In a New York Times obituary, it recorded that he had said during the establishment of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee, after the abolishment of apartheid, that after it was finally done away with, he said this, you are overwhelmed by the extent of evil, he said. But he added, It was necessary to open the wound to cleanse it. In return for an honest account of past crimes, the committee offered amnesty, establishing what Archbishop Tutu called the principle of restorative rather than retributive justice. What a hard and difficult and amazing thing to do that even though there was this system that was in place that was so ugly, that was so evil, that hurt so many people, that instead of retributive justice, what the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, what they were looking for was restorative. Now, why do I bring this up during this season of epiphany? You might be wondering, what does this have to do? Or maybe there's something that's in you that's saying, why are we talking about this again? Why do we have to go through this again? Haven't we heard enough? Epiphany marks our faith conviction that the coming of Jesus Christ into the world reveals and shines a light into this darkness. This is what the word epiphany means, to reveal, to show, to make known. Because Jesus came and was the light revealed into our darkness, the church also continues to reveal and we are supposed to reflect the very image and glory of God to this dark world. Now, part of that darkness is this division that we make because of ethnic and cultural differences. It hasn't gone away. It belongs on this sad spectrum that reveals our brokenhearted prejudices and biases all the way to the other end of the spectrum to outright, blatant, hard racism. It was something that not only exists in our world today, As we just saw, it also reveals itself. It rears its ugly head throughout history. But this is so close to the heart of God that this is also addressed throughout Scripture. It is addressed throughout Scripture. 
and what Paul addressed in today's passage. Friends, I am not twisting today's passage to make it fit some agenda that I want to speak about, but as we look at it, we will see clearly what is on God's heart, in God's mind, and included in the very message of the gospel. Paul had written his, this letter to the Ephesians, exploring the lofty heights of what it means to have faith and what it means of the mode of our salvation, which is through Christ alone, through His grace alone, not by works, so that not a single one of humanity could ever boast that we have earned our way to God, that we are good enough to come to God's presence. But then he moved from that awesome theme to how it worked itself out between people, specifically between Jewish followers of Jesus and Gentile followers of Jesus, which is basically the rest of us who aren't Jewish. Now, there could have been a real case for keeping things separate. It's easier. We already see it in the book of Acts in the earlier chapters. In chapter 6, there were Jewish widows who were culturally Hellenistic, and they were being overlooked and forgotten when food was being distributed to the poor and marginalized women and their families. And we're not even talking about different ethnicities here. We're talking about Jewish women who were more Hellenistic in culture. But here we have Hebrew widows, culturally Hebrew, versus culturally Hellenized Jewish widows. And it was just an easy oversight. We're just going to take care of our own. But that is not the vision of God, and it never was the vision of God. All are called together, and this is the mystery of the gospel that is revealed for us and that we're focusing on today. This is part of the gospel. Paul was revealing the importance of the mystery of Christ, that God would call him, his calling specifically, was to preach and teach this message that was given to him. I want us to think about that for a moment. God deemed this message so important that when Paul, who was not yet a believer, still named Saul, that he was uttering murderous threats against believers and he's on the road to Damascus, and when he gets to Damascus, his full intent is to kill Christians. And God meets him on that road, blinds him with the light of his glory, reveals Jesus Christ to him for this purpose. That he would call him to this ministry. That he would transform Paul's life into following Jesus Christ and into having this awesome ministry of revealing the mystery. The mystery of this gospel. God's heart beats to rescue us from division and to be together in Christ. This is how important it is to God that he plucks Paul out. That is his love for Paul, but it's also his love for us. God's heart beats to rescue us from division, to be together in Christ. Paul's calling was to preach and teach this specific message of the gospel that we are rescued. Hallelujah and amen. We are rescued from the, the power of sin. That we no longer are puppets to that power, to that ill intent power over this world and that we are freed from it. We are freed from the shackles of having to dance to sin's tune, and we are freed from that through Jesus Christ, through what he accomplished in his perfect life, his unjust death, and his resurrection. But not only that. Yes, all of that, but yes, also to the mystery revealed in Jesus Christ. This is Paul's specific message. He talks about it in verses 1 and 2 of our passage today, and he again alludes to it in verses 7 to 12. He talks to them and he says, as he's writing to them, you already know this about me. You know that I am a prisoner. Here I am in prison, and I'm writing to you about this. And if you have your Bibles open, you can also skip ahead to verse 13 it's not included in our reading today, but he was telling them, I don't want you to be dismayed. I don't want you to be discouraged for 
all the things that I'm going through because it is for your glory. It is for your good that I've been given this ministry of preaching the gospel, this, this gospel for all of us that matters here and now and into eternity. And I also am called to teach this specific message. And so he says, He's not upset that he's in jail, but he deems it so important that jail is worth it. He says, you know where I am. You know that I am here in prison, and you know that this is what has been commissioned to me. This is what has been administered to me to tell you about the mystery of this gospel. Again, in verse 7 to 12, Paul talks about this. He says, this is what I was called to preach But not only that, not only am I called to preach this to you, but I'm also called to teach this to the church so that the church understands this mystery and that the church lives it out completely. Doesn't just think upon it intellectually and and nods their intellectual assent and say, yeah, that sounds really nice, and then not do anything about it. Paul says, no, that the full manifold wisdom of God would be revealed in the church. This is why I have been called to follow Jesus Christ, to preach and to teach. To preach to you Gentiles and to teach to the church overall, lest they forget this mystery And the mystery is this. The mystery is the unfathomable, the boundless riches of Christ that he talks about here in verse 8. It is unfathomable because it is past the limits of our own understanding. It is untraceable. It is past finding out. What Paul was getting at here is that this mystery, not to be uh, thought of as something that is kept from us so that we'll never know, but it's a mystery to be revealed at its proper time. And it's a mystery that is boundless. It is the riches of Jesus Christ. It is something that we can't figure out on our own, that we couldn't have come to from our own conclusions, from our own searching, or from our own enlightenment. Oh, just give us enough time as a human race and we would figure it out. No. What Paul was talking about here was that this was a mystery that was hidden in God, that for generations was unknown, and now because of what Jesus has done, because of Jesus his sacrifice on that gruesome, terrible cross meant only for criminals the lowliest way to die in the Roman Empire that Jesus would take that all on to release this, to make this known that it is unfathomable, that we can't understand it on our own, that it is boundless. You cannot reach the depths You can't dig far enough to reach the bottom of the riches of Jesus Christ. This is according to God's eternal purpose. This is according to God's eternal purpose. It's not something that we've made up. But we see in part. And we haven't quite lived it out And it points to this, and the mystery is this, is that right now, when you're watching this, you know, this is a time in North America where we, uh, there's a saying that this is the most segregated time in North America on Sunday mornings. And that is to our absolute shame. Because we need to see this now, to live it out now, to be obedient to this scriptural truth, to this mystery of Jesus Christ that has been revealed in him, that is part of the boundless riches that we did not know before, but now we do, and we should know better that in Christ, every believer, every single believer in verse 12 has boldness and confident access through faith in him. Every single one of us has this capability, if we believe in Jesus Christ, that we can boldly 
enter, that we can confidently access our triune God because of our mediator, Jesus Christ, God the Son. There is no hierarchy elevating one group above any other, and yet for some reason we continue to live this way. This gospel message is the mystery of Jesus Christ that is revealed to us from God. The former generations weren't privy to this. They couldn't see it. They couldn't live it out in completion. And in verse 6, is this is where Paul is getting at here, that God's heart beats to rescue us from division to be together in Jesus Christ. The mystery was and still is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Together. There is no separateness. There is no uh, one type of church over here and another ethnic type of church over here. I know it makes it easier, but this is not the way that it is supposed to be. This is what Paul is alluding to here, what he's making known to us, where he's saying that this has been made clear to me and now I'm making it clear to you. I've written about it. You see this. This is what he says in verse 3, verse 4. He says, I've already written about it. You know about this. You already know that this is my ministry to you that I've been called to preach and to teach. Paul was stressing this idea that what was once apart was now made together in Jesus. He was flowing from this idea that he had already brought from an earlier chapter, in chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, that we can read together here. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the, the, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh, in Jesus' flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. It is through Christ alone that there is true peace between everyone. Christ is the one who levels all racial barriers, and in this context specifically, between the Jews and the Gentiles, there is no difference. There is no, I've got a leg up on you because I'm from this background. And now, it's not erasing culture. It's not erasing our good heritage. It's not erasing our ethnicity. But it is making it secondary to being a kingdom citizen, to our, to our highest calling, to our highest identity that we are followers of Jesus Christ. But who gets to say what kingdom citizenship looks like? Who gets to say? Growing up the way we have, and here in a Canadian context even, there's a, a flavor of what we believe kingdom citizenship might look like. It's heavily influenced by North American theology. We may have assumed that kingdom citizenship looks and feels and behaves a certain way, but we have to be so careful that we don't take our assumptions and then put it over what the Bible is trying to point us to, the deeper truth. This is how insidious our prejudices and our desire for ourselves to be right how it can blind us and make divisions that much deeper. Instead, sometimes we follow the Bible, and it's like wrapping a card in an advertisement. Take a look at this slide. It's like this. Have you seen this? Have you seen cars that are passed by, and they're just plastered by this advertisement, and it has the shape of a car. You can tell even the make and the model, and yet it's been wrapped up in something else to speak to us different information. If we're not careful, our faith can be like this, where we have the vestments and what we believe is true faith, and so we look a certain way, but yet we're never meant to be a car. 
just changing the outward paint or changing the, the skin, it doesn't change what the car is. It's just an overlay on top. But instead of just an outward change, our whole nature is supposed to be transformed. How we see ourselves and how we treat our biases and prejudices needs to change. Even that person who speaks differently than I do is no better or worse than me. A number of years ago, I listened to this radio program where I was, it, it brought to light inside just shame. You know, it was exploring this idea that just because someone spoke with a nice and proper received pronunciation accent like the royals, that they were deemed to be brighter and more knowledgeable about a host of subjects that they knew nothing about. They weren't more educated than me or less educated than me, and yet it is our assumption, just because of that accent, received pronunciation, that all of a sudden we look to them as authority figures or take something else, take what we might assume about someone because the way that they dress or how we might treat them either more positively or negatively based on outward appearance. And yet our Christian principle must be to strive for living out this mystery made known in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we are all part of one body. This is what he says here in verse 6. Each and every one of us recipients of this grace that we do not deserve. Unmerited favor. God douses us in it. He overflowingly gives it to each and every one of us. That grace being the promise of life eternal, being made adopted heirs of our triune God. And the mystery that we must strive to live out is that together we are heirs. Together we are partakers. We all share in the promise of Jesus Christ. Its roots are right at the very beginning of creation. Look at Genesis 1 verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Not one of us is less than the image of God. Each of us in both sex and whatever culture and ethnicity we have been born into are created in the very image of God. Scripture teaches in the Old Testament, this is part of God's heart, that those who were Gentiles, who wanted to be adopted into the people of God and wanted to take part in the Passover, that they could take part by becoming circumcised. It's not the outward action as much as the outward action points to the covenant and partaking in the covenant promise that God had made with his people. And God was saying, this is also an opportunity for foreigners as well. Exodus chapter 12, verses 48 and 49. That's when this points to this, is that there may be people, aliens in their midst that want to take part in the Passover, that want to recognize this God who rescues, who loves. They just have to partake in the covenant. The cross is our great leveler. There is no class distinction, no race distinction, nothing that we believe that keeps us truly separated or gives us one upmanship than anybody else. But that doesn't mean that we can ask this question, why are you still mad then? Why can't you just get over it? If we are believers in Jesus Christ, then why are you so hurt? In Christ, our ethnicity and culture isn't erased, and our past sins against one another aren't, uh, are swept away. Our past sins against one another are swept away, and we are made kingdom citizens, but yet the remnant, the, the consequences of those actions, of those words, remain and the hard work of reconciliation still remains we are forgiven in christ for these things yes but that doesn't take away the hurts that need to be mended that doesn't take away our own prejudices that twist our our lives that need to be undone that need to be revealed and worked through
And so we are called to this. Paul was called to this, and he was teaching the church that we are also called to this, that God's heart beats to rescue us from division, to work at unity, to be together in Jesus. Now, this may muddy up our understanding of our identity, because here we have our ethnic, cultural background that definitely shapes who we are. And I've made the argument that the Lord doesn't wipe that away. Look at passages like Revelation 7 of a great multitude from every nation and all tribes and people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. It is still a part of who we are in eternity. We don't just become gray, but John's vision, he mentions, he sees every people of every ethnicity. It still matters. But what supersedes this will always be our identity in the Lord, that we are all given the right to become children of God. When we are called to put our faith and trust in Jesus. And the power that resurrects our broken lives and transforms them into something totally new is the same power that works to unite us if we allow it, if we work with it, with the Spirit. You may have heard it said, what unites us is far greater than what divides us. This was spoken by JFK during an address to the Canadian Parliament on October 17th, 1961. What a great quote. And in Christ, this is far truer than any other usage of this quote. And this is something worth pouring our lives into as part of our gospel call. This is part of the gospel here and now. We're supposed to be working this out amongst us. May our identity be this beautiful understanding of being grateful for our heritage and history, but may the Spirit be working in our lives to make us fully followers of Jesus in all the ways that he calls us to obey. What jokes do we hear that are racially out of tune, that are racially insensitive? Because they're not just jokes, but they need to be weeded out of our lives. What behaviors and attitudes do we have towards each other and towards others, perhaps even as we travel westward across Lawrence and, Gil uh, and uh, Galloway? What are those deep down prejudices that come out even as we drive locally in our own neighborhood? The Lord, may he move us to prayer that our hearts would heal. Perhaps this is a call for us to read a book with an open heart that, be, that may be used by the Lord to heal and mend us in our brokenness. Now, this is not to beat you up and to shame you and to make you feel bad for maybe being white. Because I know that there is this kind of this white guilt that has been built up over these years, over this time specifically. Or this defensiveness that kind of pops up because here in Canada we definitely have our own major issues when it comes to racial insensitivity and racial oppression against our First Nations people. And maybe you're thinking, but I wasn't there. I didn't do that. And yet our brothers and sisters in Christ who are of First Nation descent, it still kills them. It still breaks their hearts. It is still so hurtful and it is still part of our church's heritage here. What work are we doing to make those men's, to heal that, to be used by God to do that work? This is God's heartbeat. This is the mystery revealed in Jesus Christ. And I've told this testimony from Alpha before. I'm going to close off with this. But it's so important and it fits well here. In another sermon just this past year, I used it. But here is the story of Partidi Emmanuel, an ethnic Hutu, who took active participation in the atrocities committed in 1994 
when Hutu people massacred Tutsi people in Rwanda. Over a period of 100 days, over 800,000 Tutsi people were killed. And Partidi Emmanuel was rightfully arrested. He took part in this. He was rightfully arrested and jailed. He spent six years in prison awaiting the trials to take place. And while in prison, he took part in an alpha series that transformed his life. And he struggled to cope with what he had done, and he realized that he needed to take action to seek peace. And see, so he wrote letters asking for forgiveness of the families of those he had destroyed. But when he got out of prison, he realized that this peace that he was living in within prison, outside, it all dissipated. What he had learned in Alpha, I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I'd never known before. And I realized I needed to forgive my, uh, I needed to forgive. He had gone through this terrible thing where his wife had had kids with another man and he realized, I need to forgive my wife like I had been forgiven. Even though I had murdered people, I forgave my wife, took care of these children that weren't his. And he realized he wanted to now seek forgiveness from these relatives and he wanted to do it not just by a letter, but he wanted to do it face to face. And so he reached out and he became, uh, he got to know and got in touch with this man, Vincent, and Partiti Emmanuel had killed Vincent's mother and grandmother. And amazingly, Vincent extended that forgiveness for the sake of unity and reconciliation. Vincent is quoted as saying this, it wasn't easy, but I realized that when one is in the Lord, everything is possible, so I decided to forgive and live together with him. It didn't erase what happened but he recognized the deeper truth of being one in the Lord, and this had to be lived out and exercised. And both men took that step that only God could empower them to do. The one to realize that he needed to seek forgiveness and make amends, and the other to actually grant forgiveness in order to live out what it means to really follow Jesus. This is our call. We are all partakers of the mystery revealed in Jesus Christ. We are fellow heirs. We are fellow members of the body. We are fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, may you see hearts that are not hard, but hearts that are open to saying that we need help, that we are indeed broken people, that our church is broken, that our church, the way we live it out, or actually the way we don't live out our faith, has hurt so many people. It has pushed young people away where they don't see the evidence of our faith. It has pushed people away who are feeling even more marginalized or seeing this dominant culture being so defensive. Lord, forgive us. God, may you transform us Lord, we, your people, need a revival through the Holy Spirit. We need to be confronted again by the goodness of the gospel, that this is the mystery revealed in Jesus Christ, that not only are we saved, saved to be ultimately in relationship with you, but we are saved to be one body, brothers and sisters in Christ from all over. So God, forgive us for those clinging on to those things that divide us. Forgive us for not working hard enough and making people feel welcome and truly belonging. But make us a church that reflects the glory of the Lord, that works at living out 
the manifold wisdom of, of who you are, God. And that our heart would beat with the same passion of what your heart beats for, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, let's respond to the Lord uh, with our givings, giving back to him a portion of all that he has given to us. If you are able to, and as the Holy Spirit is leading you to at this time, to give to the ministry of our church as we serve our neighborhood here. And let's join now in singing the doxology. Let's pray. God, transform us that we might be joyful givers. We are people who hold things tightly, and yet, God, we want to respond to your love by giving back to you freely, by giving back to you generously. Father, we entrust our whole lives to you. Now use these generous gifts from your people that it may grow your kingdom, that we would serve our neighborhood, and that we would glorify you and seek to glorify you most of all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's sing our song of response. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name, which talks about every kindred, every tribe, ascribing majesty to our mighty King, the one who deserves it. Let's praise him together.
Please consider joining us for Grace Connections at 11.45 a.m. this morning. Uh, it's just a chance for us to continue to try to stay connected. Uh, this is the tools that are available to us right now, and so I do want to invite you. Perhaps this is something that you find yourself not comfortable doing, and yet I would love for you to learn so that we can see your face and so that we can, again, just stay connected as a church family. It's so important that, uh, that we fellowship together. And so please do consider joining us. Uh, the link can be found on uh, the weekly email that is sent out. Uh, and it's also posted on Zoom, uh, on Facebook as well. So uh, you can find the link there. And so please consider uh, joining us this week. Please take this blessing with you from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, just a number of verses on, as Paul knows how hard it is for us. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.